now on an azoffroad.net special. We begin our epic four-day, 450-mile journey across Arizona as we work our way from Phoenix to the bottom of the Grand Canyon using as few paved roads as possible. Along the way, we'll face some of the toughest trails in Arizona as we take the road less traveled and push our vehicle to the limit. Scotty here from azoffroad.net. Now last summer we did an epic road trip along Route 66 in a brand new 2013 Camaro. But we decided, you know, it's time to do an equally epic off-road trip. So we're here today with my cousin Daniel all the way from Ohio. Uh, we did the trip last year together. Yeah. And uh, like you said, it was in one word, epic. Let's check that out. Challenge. Your goal is to make it from this spot in West Phoenix to the Colorado River at the bottom of the Grand Canyon using as few paved roads as possible. Along the way, you'll drive through sandy river bottoms, climb steep mountains, drive over red rocks, volcanic ash, and finally drop over 3,000 feet to end at the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon. Our planned course would take us 450 miles across Arizona beginning at I-10 in Avondale, up the Hacienda River, along the back way to Crown King to Horse Thief Lake. Then, it'd be up Senator Highway, over to Jerome via old railroad beds and into Sedona. From there, we would hit Broken Arrow, Shtebley Hill Road, Cinder Hills OHV area, and a series of forest roads to head north and eventually west around the San Francisco Peaks and over to Peach Springs. Once in Peach Springs, we would follow Diamond Creek Road as it drops over 3,000 feet to end at the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon. Of course, all of this would require a capable vehicle. For this trip, I would be using my very own 1994 Jeep Grand Cherokee. With a big 5.2 liter V8 engine, we would have 220 horses and 280 pound-feet of torque at our disposal. The Jeep also has a 3.5 inch suspension lift, 31 inch tires, skid plates, a custom roof rack, two spare tires, and plenty of lights in addition to some other upgrades. All of this would hopefully be enough for our 400 plus mile off-road journey across Arizona. So I say without further ado, let's hit the road. Let's do this. Let's go. It's about 12.30 p.m. when we finally packed up the Jeep and hit the road. For the first leg of the journey, we would have some family tag along and a second vehicle to provide moral support before splitting up on our own in a couple hours. From Avondale, we hit Loop 303 northbound and set our sights for the Hacienda River. Yeah, the back way to Carol King is this, probably the second hardest trail. We're and we're doing it like right away. Like yeah. Jesus yeah, I don't know. Miles rolled by and about an hour later we pulled off the US-60 in Morristown to play around in the Hacienda for a little bit. Here we got a taste of our first off-road experience of the trip. In the river bottom we navigated the open Hacienda and headed to the scenic Red Cliffs before turning back. As we headed north we left the Hacienda and used dirt roads to connect with Arizona 74. Along the 74 we headed east 25 miles to Castle Hot Springs Road. It was about 3 p.m. when we wound past Lake Pleasant and hit our first air down point at the start of the 26 mile long back way to Crown King. Freaking mud in there, jeez. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. It's alright. As the road split from Castle Hot Springs Road, Daniel and I left behind our moral support and with lower tire pressure, embarked on what would surely be an insane journey. The first 15 miles passed quickly as we settled into the Jeep. Without any major obstacles, this portion of the trail made it easy to underestimate the trail as a whole, as we would soon find out. 
after taking a break at the famous CK Rock and posing the Jeep for pictures of this well-known landmark, we continued east as the trail got narrower and steeper. From this point on, things would get significantly rougher until we reached Crown King. That has a bypass, right? But there is one of them that I don't think has a bypass. So I'm going to save my last piece of if you jack want. links for that. Bills came and went, and the Jeep was appearing to handle things quite nicely. That is, until the check engine light came on a few miles later. After pulling off the trail to see what was going on, we decided to give the Jeep a break before continuing on. While we were lucky enough to have cooler than average May temperatures, we were now wheeling at the hottest part of the day, a big no-no if you're trying to go easy on your vehicle. After attributing the check engine light to a faulty fuel injector wire, we pressed on. The hills got slightly rougher and at this point, we were surprised by what we came across next. Out here, in the middle of freaking nowhere, sat a Dodge Neon. Much to my amusement, since my cousin Daniel owns a Neon, we joked and seriously wondered how that car made it this far into the mountains. We went over some rough stuff again. Maybe it was helicopter. Possibly. But why would you, why would you helicopter a Neon halfway up a trip? I can think of a couple reasons. Not wasting too much time, we continued on. It was getting late in the day and we had begun to hit traffic returning from Crown King. It was 5 p.m. when we finally crossed into the Prescott National Forest. While the trail was more shaded, things got rougher still. The trail certainly wasn't difficult, but crossing through boulder-strewn creeks and climbing up rock ledges, things were pushing the edge of moderate. Then it happened. The Jeep decided it had had enough of the bumps and bucked before stalling out and coming to a dead stop in the middle of a pretty tight section of trail. How could this happen so soon? While we were on the second toughest trail of the trip, this was an unsettling sign of finishing the trip. Things were doubtful. The Jeep wouldn't restart, so I popped the hood. After looking things over and willing the Jeep to start again, it did. We were on our way, hoping that it wouldn't happen again. After some narrow climbs, we passed through the rough section around Oro Bell. Here, there was water on the trail, and navigating the rocky creek bottom proved to be quite bumpy. Yeah, buddy. Look out. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> insane. Oh. This thing is up. He sees it. Turn around. Don't drown. Turn around. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. Put your window up, man. More for you. That's <laughs> why my window is such, such a baby. Come on. Uh-uh. I haven't gotten wet. Mine's down. The whole so? <laughs> no, leave it down. Uh-uh. Leave it down. I ain't leave getting it. muddy. I'm leaving mine down. We're not going real fast. What is, was it? What is it they say? Turn around, don't. Okay. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, we're putting the window up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Not once has the water even splashed on the windshield yet, for the record. Yeah, well, I don't want it to. My goal is to get you wet before this trip is over. No. Yeah. No. I'm going to charge you for replacing that motor when it goes 
Oh. What? They, oh. Rolling up and down. That was 30 seconds. Screw you. Finally, around 6 o'clock that night, we were on the final ascent into Crown King. One last huge hill and we had finished off the challenging back way to Crown King. Fighting sun in our eyes, we made it up the hill and onto easier roads. Okay, slow down, slow down, slow down. Hey, sometimes you just gotta hammer up the hill. By about 6.45, we were rolling across the bridge into downtown Crown King, where we decided to stop for dinner. There was just one problem. Nothing was open. Again, luck was not on our side. Everything in Crown King closes at 6 o'clock on Sunday, since all of their customers have already left by this time. With no options for food, we figured to head for our cabin near Horse Thief Lake, six miles from downtown. We continued back up the road and split off the road towards Horse Thief. The miles seemed to crawl by. The trail was bumpy and we were hungry. It was getting dark soon and after a brutal day, we were ready to stop for the night. A couple miles from the cabin, we came across a view that stopped us in our tracks. The sun was setting and the entire southern half of the Bradshaw Mountains were in full view of the trail. We pulled off and enjoyed the moment, which almost made the whole day's efforts worth it. As the sun set, darkness crept over the mountain peaks and the trail we had been on a few hours before was lost in the shadows. We pressed on, and by 7.45, had reached our stop for the night, Horse Thief Cabin. We quickly unlocked the gate to the cabin and pulled in to get unloaded. While quaint, the cabin had everything we needed, including a new addition, electricity. Wait, what? I have no idea. Um, I'm not supposed to have electricity, right? It, it has electricity. Would you look at that? What the hell? And it's got, ooh, two beds, three beds. Nice, I'm in a bathroom, wow. And a shower. What? Fancy. We got food going in the oven while we brought our belongings inside for the night. The day had taken a toll on everyone. Daniel was beat. I was dead tired. The Jeep managed to make it, but had a few difficulties of its own along the way. We called it a night around 10.30 because we knew that our journey was only just getting started. Next time, we continue our journey as we complete day two of our journey from Phoenix to the bottom of the Grand Canyon using as few paved roads as possible. We'll travel on Senator Highway through the town of Prescott and over former railroad beds to the town of Jerome before ending the night in Sedona.